So next we have Janet Song from Boston Children's Hospital. And Janet's favorite uh, neurotransmitter is glutamate, cause, so she's very exciting. Um, <laughs> and she's going to talk to us about genomic approaches to understand the evolution of the human brain. So many scientists, myself included, are really interested in understanding the genetic basis of human evolution. Even from these cartoon drawings, we can already see some of the differences between humans and closely related species, such as the move from four-legged locomotion to two-legged upright walking, changes in cranial facial morphology between this chimp skull and this human skull, and expansion in cranial and brain size between chimps and humans. I'm particularly interested in understanding how the human brain evolved. At a gross level, the human brain is much larger than that of the common animal model, the mouse, as well as other primates. Unlike mice, the human brain is also folded, increasing surface area. At a finer level, researchers have identified multiple human-specific features of the brain. Uh, for instance, the relative size of the prefrontal cortex compared to the primary visual cortex is larger than in humans compared to other primates. Human neurons in the prefrontal cortex also have more spines per dendritic branch. And humans have elaborated astrocytes in both size and in the number of processes compared to mice. We can also appreciate that humans differ in many complex behaviors, including social behaviors. And it's likely that these behavioral anatomical um, cha and cha changes in humans are encoded by changes in the human genome. So beyond a natural curiosity to understand what makes us human, understanding the genetic basis of these human traits can also inform our understanding of human diseases. Research suggests that larger, the evolution of larger brains with increased connectivity may have affected our susceptibility for psychiatric and neurodevelopmental diseases. For instance, regions in the genome that are recently diverged between humans and Neanderthals are enriched for schizophrenia GWAS loci. And in my postdoctoral work with, uh, in collaboration with Tay and Ryan, we saw that rare recessive variants in human accelerated regions, which are regions that are likely under positive selection in humans, uh, contribute to autism risk in a consanguineous cohort. And this contribution is similar to or greater than the contribution of validated or candidate neural enhancers that do not have signatures of selection in humans. Now, the obvious place to look for uh, sequence changes that might be important in human evolution would be to look at protein coding changes. But decades ago, Mary Claire King and Alan Wilson found that human and chimpanzee proteins are 99% identical, and thus postulated that, quote, their macromolecules are so alike that regulatory mutations may account for their biological differences. And indeed, decades of research in different vertebrate systems suggest that it's non-coding changes and not coding changes uh, that account for most of evolutionary change. And so why might this be? Well, let's imagine we have a key gene critical for normal development that is expressed in the heart, the eye, the brain, and the lungs. And its expression in these tissues is controlled by tissue-specific regulatory regions. If we change the, um, the coding sequence of this gene, it will affect its function in all of these tissues. And so perhaps this is evolutionarily advantageous in one tissue, maybe it leads to a larger brain, but it could have deleterious effects in other tissues that outweigh the selective advantage. Instead, if we just change the regulatory sequence that changes the expression of this gene within the brain, perhaps we can still get the evolutionarily advantageous increase in brain size without affecting its function in other tissues. Uh, so how can we identify the non-coding sequence changes uh, that are important in human evolution. Well, there are around 125 million variants between humans and chimps, and most of these are non-functional. And so we really want to identify the small proportion of variants that have large effect sizes. And since we're starting from millions of variants, we can't just start experimentally testing them. And instead, we need to come up with ways to prioritize these variants for functional study and then to screen them for function. So a common approach to prioritize these variants is to compare the genomes of humans that have, to that of other closely related species. Uh, this approach has identified regions that are likely under positive selection, as well as regions that are deleted in, or sorry, conserved through other mammals, suggesting functional importance, but are then deleted in humans. 
An alternative approach has been to compare the tissues of hu humans to other closely related species and identify genes that change in expression or non-coding regions with different chromatin features associated with different regulatory functions. This was first applied using bulk methods and more recently with single cell methods, including by us in collaboration with the Allen Institute to identify thousands of genes and non-coding regions that change um, specifically in humans. And so these approaches have allowed us to go from the millions of variants between humans and chimps to maybe thousands of candidate sequence changes uh, that might do something in human evolution. But thousands is still a lot. And so it'd be great if we could further improve and refine this prioritization. So one way to do this is very simple. Uh, since these human evolved regions were first identified, new and improved genomes have become available. And in my postdoc, I was interested um, and re-identifying these human conserved deletions, which are regions conserved through other mammals, suggesting functional importance, but deleted in humans, suggesting that they have a human-specific function. And I was interested in H. condyles that are relatively large, 25-plus base pairs to multiple kilobases in length. And if you look at the H. condyles in the size range that have previously been identified, it turns out that a lot of them are actually deleted and improved human references, are polymorphic in humans, um, if you look at additional primates, are not conserved or also deleted in these species. And so uh, I re-identified the H. condyles and find around 335, around 200 of which um, had not been previously identified. Interestingly, these H. condyles are actually enriched in your genes associated with autism and severe neurodevelopmental disorders, suggesting that they may play roles during early brain development. Okay, so this is a relatively simple way to improve prioritization of comparative genomics approaches. Uh, what about comparative transcriptomics and epigenomics approaches? So one major drawback of these approaches is that they cannot distinguish between cis and trans changes. So what do I mean by that? Well, imagine we have a gene controlled by this weak blue enhancer, sometimes bound by the transcription factor, drive low levels of gene expression. Perhaps in humans, there is a sequence variant that makes this enhancer much stronger, leading to more TF binding and higher levels of gene expression. In contrast, let's again imagine a similar scenario with a weak enhancer driving low levels of transcription. Perhaps in humans, there are higher levels of this transcription factor, leading to more TF binding and higher levels of transcription. And so traditional comparative approaches really can't distinguish between cis changes due to link sequence variants and trans changes due to changes in the cellular environment and the levels of diffusible factors like transcription factors. And it's really important to distinguish between cis and trans changes because it's the cis changes, the cis acting sequence variants that drive cis regulated gene expression changes and it's changes in the levels of these proteins, maybe some of which are TFs or through signal transduction, other TFs that then drive the uh, changes in trans regulated gene expression. So in my graduate work with David Kingsley at Stanford, we realized we could distinguish cis from trans changes by comparing the human and chimp genomes within the same cell. So if we look at human and chimp genomes within separate cells, we cannot, again, distinguish between cis and trans changes. But if we look at the human and chimp genome within the same cell, cis changes are preserved, but trans changes are no longer observed because they're now exposed to the exact same cellular environment. So to make this model, we took human-induced pluripotent stem cells and chimp-induced pluripotent stem cells, fused them to make allotetraploid iPS cells. This model was developed concurrently by Hunter Fraser's lab. We also uh, fused human-human and chimp-chimp diploid iPS cells to make autotetraploids as controls. We show that these tetraploids can maintain normal and stable carrier types. Um, and excitingly, if you compare these autotetraploids to their parental diploid lines, there are very few gene expression differences. In fact, there are less than between two diploids of the same species. And so this suggests that at least in iPS cells, uh, tetraploidization does not have an appreciable effect on gene expression. So my postdoc, I've been taking these diploid, autotetraploid, and allotetraploid lines, differentiating them into neural progenitors, which have expanded in size and proliferative capacity in humans, and performed RNA-seq to look at changes in gene expression, and attack sequencing to look at changes in chromatin accessibility, which is associated with enhancer regions. Um, and we've identified genes and non-coding regions that are cis-regulated, such as, you know, these two cartoons schematized here. And we can now 
uh, drill down at the sequence level and identify candidate sequence changes that may underlie changes in chromatin accessibility and nearby changes in cis-regulated gene expression. Um, and so we believe that these two approaches um, can help us to further prioritize these candidate sequence changes. And so how then will we test variants for function? Well, until recently, methods to functionally characterize these candidate regions were really low throughput and laborious. Uh, so researchers would test candidate regions one at a time, enhance reporter assays or transgenic mouse models, and very few were actually tested in sort of gold standard experiments at their endogenous locus by humanizing a mouse, mice models, or sort of ancestralizing uh, human cell culture models. Um, and as many people have noted in this conference, with the advent of CRISPR, we can now do this in a more high throughput manner. So I've been using CRISPR inhibition or CRISPR I, which uses a non-functional a nucle uh, a Cas9 that cannot cut DNA, uh, fused to a crab domain, which heterochromatizes or oppresses the surrounding region. Um, and this system has been previously used to look for regulatory regions that control nearby gene expression. And so I'm taking human and chimp iPS cells that express dead Cas9 crab, differentiating them into cell types of interest, such as neural progenitors, uh, transducing them with a lenti guide RNA library targeting human-specific variants, and then performing single cell RNA sequencing to see what genes, if any, are regulated by the target region in this particular cell type. So I've now performed multiple CRISPR screens, but in the interest of time, I'll just highlight one example here. So this is an H. condyl, H. condyl 91, that's located intronic to this gene at 4L. Um, and actually, in the CRISPR-I screen, we find that it regulates this gene, one cut 2 and none of these other intervening genes um, in neural progenitors. And one cut 2 is a transcription factor. Um, one cut 2 knockout mice actually have a failure to thrive, suggesting it's relatively important during development. Little is known about its function in the nervous system except a few papers that suggest that overexpression of one cut 2 in vitro can promote neuronal differentiation. Um, so I validated this hit from the CRISPR eye screen in two different uh, chimpanzee cell lines by singly infecting chimp neural progenitors with either non-targeting control guide RNAs or guide RNAs targeting the H. condyl, and we see a nice decrease in one cut 2 expression. If we look at gene expression genome-wide, we see that genes that change in expression are enriched in processes involved in the cell cycle and metabolic processes involved in hypoxia and glycolysis that are known to promote neurogenesis. And this, so this suggests the hypothesis that perhaps the presence of this H. condyl in chimps leads to higher expression of one cut 2, which promotes neuronal differentiation, leading to a relatively smaller brain. But that deletion of this H. condyl in humans may lead to lower expression of one cut 2 and have contributed to increased brain size. And so in summary, I'm really interested in going from the millions of variants between humans and chimps to identify the select few that have large effects on human evolution. I've used new and improved genomes and developed a human chimpanzee uh, tetraploid model to try to prioritize uh, these uh, sequence variants and then screen them to assess their effect on nearby gene expression. So in, in addition to following up on some of the things I've described here and trying to think of new ways to prioritize or screen these variants, long term, I'm also interested in applying these approaches to other cell types or environmental paradigms, performing detailed single locus characterization of hits from these CRISPR-I screens to really get at their cellular, circuit level, or behavioral phenotypes, and assessing the contribution of human-specific variants to disease risk. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank my postdoctoral advisor, uh, Chris Walsh, my graduate advisor, David Kingsley. The Walsh and the Kingsley Labs are many collaborators, especially for the projects I talked about here, Mike Greenberg and Eva Carter, our funding sources, and of course, Leading Edge for this opportunity. So thanks. Should I? Uh, uh, amazing talk, I, I loved it. So I was wondering, uh, in your condyls, how many of them derive from transposable elements? And if that is specific one of one cut two, uh, it's yeah. repetitive derived or? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, so the one in one cut two is not a transposable element. Um, actually, I think very few of them are, although I don't remember like the exact mm -hmm. percentage mm -hmm. off the top of my head. Um, one thing I didn't mention, which I actually had a lot of time, so maybe I should have mentioned it, is I just wanted to point out that 
um, 88 percent of these previously identified H. condyles um, we don't see with sort of stricter criteria, but we're also including more genomes, so it's possible those genomes themselves have errors. Some of these 88 percent may indeed be real, so that's like one caveat. Yeah. Excellent talk, Janet. Uh, I'm curious, like, have you identified any key player genes like uh, that has linked with the uh, social behavior? And in your talk, you also presented that you are planning to improve the assembly. And I was, I, I'm curious that because uh, you are working with the model organism, I assume they already have chromosome level assembly. Uh, and so what sort of improve, uh, improvements are you planning? Uh, yeah, so the first question was whether, you know, we've looked at anything related to social behaviors. Um, so here, I guess I completely focus on neural progenitors, um, which is sort of one of the hallmark traits, but we're actually also doing very similar experiments in excitatory neurons. Um, I'm not going to flip all the way back to, like, sort of an early slide, but I sort of skimmed over this project where we looked at um, autism cohorts, and there we've actually followed up on a few of these regions like lunar positive selection, um, which drive different levels of enhancer activity um, in the brain, in neurons, and in, they're near this gene called IL-1 RAPL1, which is really important at synapses. And so we think that the uh, dysregulation of um, some of these enhancer regions in autism may contribute to some of uh, autism risk. Um, as to your second question, yeah, so I'm, uh, I guess, not very interested in <laughs> genome assembly, or I'm not working on it. Um, but in terms of improving prioritization, I think some of the other areas, and this was nicely highlighted by a paper that came out either early this year or late last year, um, a lot of work with comparative genomics has really focused on regions that are conserved through other mammals so that we can say, like, oh, these are likely to be functional. Um, but and we've just, like, completely ignored the rest of the genome that is not highly conserved through other mammals. But likely, a lot of these regions are also under selection. And so I'm really interested, for instance, in looking at human-specific insertions um, and trying to figure out which of these might actually have some role to play in human evolution. Cool talk. Um, I have uh, two relatively naive questions. What does it mean by human accelerated regions? That's oh. number one. And second, uh, like I saw these bunch of papers on primate AI. Does that help uh, assign roles to some of these variants that are currently yeah. not? Um, so, uh, so I'll answer the first question first. Uh, so human accelerated regions are actually like the darlings of this field, I would say. Um, they're regions that are highly conserved through other um, mammals but have accelerated like substitution rates, so they have a lot of base pair changes, specifically in humans. Um, and actually, there was a paper just last month that sort of re-identified them with new and improved genomes, similar to what I showed here for H. condyles. Um, with primate AI, do you mean um, like the primate papers that came out like last week? Okay, yeah. So those are great. I'm, I feel like this is a great month for this field because so many new genomes have been released, including um, I think 233 like new primate genomes. Yeah, so I'm really interested in looking at um, sort of variation, for instance, with the H. condyles across such a like larger clade than what I'm currently looking at. Um, and I think that will also really help with um, a lot of our work has looked at uh, things that are conserved through all mammals because we don't have that many primates to look at. But now we have so many primate sequences, perhaps we can focus on things that are changing in humans relative to other primates. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry, just uh, another question. So you were using the Cas9 crab. Mm -hmm. So and your variants are more than 25 base pairs. Mm -hmm. You yes. Said, so you're using like a single guide. Is yeah, is a technical oh, yeah. question, I guess. Yeah, so yeah. you're using a single guide per, per variant. Um, so I'm using three different guides per region. So the regions range from 25 base pairs to like multiple kilobases. If they were uh, larger than like 500 base pairs, um, then I would break them into multiple regions and target three guides per region. Actually. Again, I guess I talked really fast. Um, I thought I wouldn't have time. But the H. condyle I showed, we actually tested two different regions on the CRISPR eye screen because it's actually six and a half kilobases. And one of the really nice things about the CRISPR eye screen is one of the regions we test, and we only did two out of 6.5 because only two regions are highly conserved within this deletion. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the regions we tested did not affect gene expression in neural progenitors at all. And it was only this other region that did. And so that also really nicely helped us hone in on the area of this H. condyle that might be important in neural progenitors. Yeah. 
and are you planning to do the Cas9 DTR or gain of function experiments, maybe introducing the, the team uh, sequence in the human? Yeah, so I, I do think gain of function experiments are really interesting. I think in some sense we can sort of think of them as sort of uh, like loss of function is kind of testing like is it necessary and then gain of function like sufficiency. Um, so far I've really focused on sort of the necessary question um, because I'm pretty interested in modeling these in mice or in like by ch making the actual change of the endogenous locus. And so I'm more interested in figuring out is it necessary so that if I make, I go to the effort to make the mouse, will it like likely actually have a phenotype? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much.